Blessings of Allah Azza wa Jal be upon every single one of you. A very good evening from the Islamic Society. About a week ago, we had an event in collaboration with the Christian Fellowship and the Islamic Society on a topic called Interfaith Dialogue. And within that topic, a small segment which took, well, one segment which had the most time, took 15 minutes, which is Jesus in respect to the Islamic society and the Christian fellowship. However, 15 minutes were not enough to give justice to such a comprehensive topic. Hence, today, Allah Ta'ala, Mr. Abu Mus'ab will help us demystify some misconceptions and enlighten us with Jesus or love for Jesus in Islam. So please help me in welcoming Mr. Abu Mus'ab. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's um, 8.15. Um, maybe some of you had a long day and you might be somewhat sleepy. Um, there's a way to overcome this issue. And that is, if you're caught sleeping during the lecture, you will simply have to pay 500 ringgits once I call your name out. Is that a lot of money, 500 ringgits? Oh, really? Oh, you guys are balling here. Uh, no, honestly, the lecture, inshallah, should be uh, new information for many people that haven't delved into this. Meaning, if you haven't been exposed to the interfaith dialogue concept, if you're not into this uh, you know, idea of knowing what other religions have to believe, if you're a Christian who's never really sat with a Muslim who knows their religion and had a long discussion, this would be news for you. It was news for everybody that I've ever presented this to. Simply because in our experience with uh, fellow Christians, who by the way, are the closest people to us. Um, and you can ask anyone involved in invitation to Islam. When you try to communicate the message of Islam with someone, there are certain common grounds uh, that rarely ever exist. But the most common grounds we have with any group of people are the Christians. Because we agree on so many things and we disagree on some smaller things, but the magnitude of these smaller things make all the difference. And I've also found out in my humble experience that it is primarily because of lack of awareness about the Islamic stance. Let me not go far. Today, just today, in the exhibition, where I was on the second floor, uh, a young man came. Uh, with a, he's a Christian. He had some views that he was adhering to and he wanted to have a nice little dialogue. And within a few minutes, I thought I was saying something that for sure he knew. And I told him, you we Muslims, we believe in Jesus and this, this and that. And he said, I never in my life thought that you guys believed in Jesus. He was completely clueless about something that is mentioned in the Quran, 20, a person mentioned in the Quran 25 times. Jesus, peace be upon him, by name, is mentioned 25 times. The only woman mentioned by name in the Quran is Mary, the mother of Jesus. No other woman, including the wives of the Prophet, the mother of the Prophet, himself Prophet Muhammad, no woman got the privilege of having a chapter named after her except Mary. And of course you can get a copy of the Quran and find out for yourself. So it's, it's mind-boggling that some people are unaware about the stance of Jesus in Islam. This is why the, tech, the, the lecture is actually love for Jesus and this is why I'm going to be quoting Jesus. Why? If you have a conversation with an average Christian and again this was exemplified today, you will find out that for the most part the quotations are from Saint Paul or a quotation that someone said about Jesus rarely you get it sometimes, rarely do you get what Jesus actually said. And believe it or not, as a Muslim, I take offense. I am offended when we have a statement attributed to the messenger of God, Jesus himself, and then someone ignores what he said and prefers to accept something someone said about him. And in any logical 
context, you can do that. If you have this spokesman himself telling you something, you can say, well, I'm not interested in what you have to say. I'm going to ask him about what he has to say about the matter. When the person himself is available, he told you something about it. So taking it from the source is important. And this is why we would like to quote Jesus. Now there's a system, there's a process in this lecture. What I'm going to do, inshallah, is break down for you what the tenets of Christian faith are. Now, the challenge that I will face, for sure, is that because of the variation in the denominations of Christianity, at any point in time, someone may stand up and say, thank you very much, but that does not represent me. Because they follow some other denomination within Christianity that may not be mainstream. So I recognize that this may not tailor to every single individual, but this would tailor to the majority of Christians. Whether it is Catholics, born again, Protestants, Jehovah Witnesses, all of these major groups and then those which are more minor, agree to a large degree to those tenets of faith. So we would present it, then we will present biblical evidence to the contrary, which is the most interesting aspect. That before I tell you what Islam has to say, which is a given, I'm a Muslim, so I'm going to give you my perspective on things. It is interesting that you become aware of biblical verses that you probably don't even know about. That speak about the same exact subject matter. Then I will give you the Islamic evidence. And on top of that, I will give you a logical argument. Something from our practical daily life that you can relate to. And so, let's go through them one by one. The foundations of the Christian faith are original sin, atonement, redemption by crucifixion, the divinity of Jesus, and of course, Trinity. So we will tackle them one by one, highlight some of the issues, mention the references. Fortunately for you and me, everything is referenced. Whether it is a biblical verse, I'm going to put which Bible, which version of the Bible it is from. And if it's a Quranic verse, likewise. So all you have to do is take a note, cross-check in case I made a mistake uh, or in case you don't trust me and that I'm bluffing you. For both reasons, you can take the references and check them out later on your own. Now, according to the most common teaching of Christians, all people inherit Adamic guilt are, and are in a state of sin from the moment of conception. So supposedly, because Adam disobeyed God, and for the feminists, I would like to add that according to the Christian church, uh, Eve was the source of the problem. So the blame is actually placed on Eve being the one who seduced Adam into sin. For your reference, the Islamic point of view is against that tooth and nail. In Islam, Allah mentions in the Quran that both of them disobeyed God. It was not Eve uh, who's the purpose or the reason behind the fall of Adam. It was a mutual agreed upon disobedience from both Adam and Eve that resulted in what we have today. So we as Muslims don't blame women for the problems of the world. But if you speak to a traditional uh, conventional Christian, if they will admit that, of course, because you might face some difficulty in that. Uh, they will tell you that it's actually Eve. And there are many priests who wrote many letters and poetry, belittling women and calling her all types of stuff, and that she will suffer in pregnancy and suffer in delivery as a result of her being the cause behind the fall of Adam. Again, this is something that Islam rejects tooth and nail. So the biblical evidences which contradict this concept that you were born with sin. How could you be born with sin when the Bible says... The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor th th shall the father bear the guilt of the son. It goes on to say, The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked should be upon himself. And this is in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18, verse 20, according to the New King James Version. Now it is interesting that a biblical verse is explicitly saying that whatever problems you create in, in your own life, it's your responsibility. And no one can be blamed for the actions of others. So it is inconceivable that Adam and Eve will disobey God and then we are born guilty. 
because we were not consulted in the matter. We didn't approve. If we were asked, we would have said, no, please don't eat from the tree. In Islam, we don't know what kind of tree it is. It's not an apple tree. But we could have said, no, thank, don't do this because we would like to stay in paradise. None of us was consulted in the subject matter. So how can we be guilty of something that we didn't do? The Bible rejects this idea. The Islamic evidences obviously reject this idea. Allah says, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها لها ما كسبت وعليها ما اكتسبت. Allah does not charge a soul except with that which it's within its capacity. And it shall have the consequences of what good it has gained and it will bear the consequence of what evil it has earned. And so you see the harmony and the consistency and the correlation between a biblical teaching and an Islamic teaching. Both of them aiming at the same exact thing versus what the church is teaching. And we will see later on in the presentation, we will find out exactly where they got this stuff from. And when you know the source, you will be dumbfounded. How could this have happened so many years after Jesus and people still attribute this to Jesus? Peace be upon him. Further, Allah says, وَلَا تَزِرُ وَزِرَةٌ وِزْرَ أُخْرَى And a, a bearer of burdens will not bear the burden of another. So if Adam and Eve committed a sin, you are born free of guilt. And also from a logical point of view, if you are born sinful from the moment of birth, technically speaking, if you died, then you're doomed to hell. Because you never got the chance to accept Jesus, quote unquote, as your Lord and Savior. You're an infant who's two days old. You had no choice in the matter. So if you're born in the state of sin with the Adamic guilt, now your destination is the hellfire before you even got to say uh, as a little baby. That is, just doesn't add up. In our Islamic minds, that doesn't add up. And it's important as a Christian to understand this. Now, there's a disclaimer I wanted to give in the beginning and I forgot. So I'm going to squeeze it in right now. The disclaimer is, Whenever someone speaks about religion passionately, people have the tendency to turn on their emotional reactions and turn off their rational reactions. And if you were to do so, then you can successfully deny everything I'm going to say now because you are in the state of being offended. But I beg you, in spite of what may appear to be offensive, even though it's not, it's just sharing information, don't, you, don't use your emotions to decipher and comprehend and digest this data because if you do so, you will not reach your objective. I would like you to rely on your intellect strictly. Even though you may feel offended, it's, it's okay. Forgive me for it. I, I ask you to forgive me beforehand. But try, try to reason. Listen to what's being said. Understand the context. Otherwise, you will make the wrong, the wrong decisions. Just to give you an example from real life, you could be driving your car and then some, some jerk will come and cut you off and it will finger you and, and you know, flick you off and you just get very upset. And let's say you have the strength to take revenge. You could. You get out of your car and you beat the crap out of this person. But then guess what? You go to jail. And you have a problem now, you get kicked out of school, your family suffers. There could be some major consequences. And if someone were to tell you after you get arrested, would you like to go back in time and stay in your car and not act upon your emotions and anger? You would say, I wish, I wish I shut up. I wish I stayed in the car. Everybody regrets the moment of anger. Everybody regrets that emotional uh, uh, eruption that they go through. And they only feel guilty afterwards when it's all said and done and the milk has been spilled. So this is why don't rely on your emotions. Understand things rationally. I'll skip that just for time restraints. So needless to say, needless to say, from a logical point of view, uh, your father, hypothetically speaking, your father commits a crime. He murders someone. And so the police come and knock on the door you say, my father is not there. They said, who are you? I'm a son. All right, you're coming to prison. But I, I didn't do anything. Tough luck for you, buddy. You're his son. No one would accept that. No law, no country. Nowhere in the world would this be acceptable. And people will have a riot. And they will have human rights involvement. And everybody will come and say, how in the world? How in the world are you going to charge this person for the guilt 
and the sin and the crime of his father. No one will accept that. But when it comes to us being born sinful because of Adam and Eve, it's somehow okay? Even though the magnitude of that sin is way greater than a crime that your father may commit, it's amazing, the double standards. Really amazing. Atonement. Does anyone know what atonement is and where it came from? Atonement is an invented Christian term that didn't exist before the 16th century. And it was made to reconcile with God. It's actually at one mint. Meaning, how do you uh, rectify your separation from God? How do you go back to God? They had to come up with this term based on a new belief that was not existent in the past. So that's where atonement came from. And it's a doctrine that describes how sin can be forgiven by God. So how do you, and of course we will see in the future slides, in the next few slides, that according to Christianity, it's the crucifixion of Jesus and the death of Jesus and the resurrection of, resurrection of Jesus. And then of course, your acceptance of Jesus as Lord and Savior. That is the means by which your sins are forgiven. Uh, but is that really it? Is that really it according to the Bible? We learn from the Bible that the way for sins to be forgiven is not by accepting Jesus as Lord and Savior. No, no, no. It's actually by repentance. It says in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, from that time Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Pretty ironic for someone who came to die for everybody. Why would he bother? A, a very uh, eloquent, articulate messenger of God with a mission at hand, with people on the verge of going to the hellfire, a very critical scenario. Instead of telling the people straight up, directly, flat out, accept me as Lord and Savior, he chooses to tell them instead, repent. The exact opposite of what they would want. Again, many Christians, sadly, don't know these exist. Or if they know they exist, what happens? Ya yeah, Bashir, like today in the discussion we had, Ya yeah, Ammi, Wallah, I, I lost my mind. I, I lost my... In the discussion we had with this Christian, when, when we, if you say this to him, you know what he will say? He say, you don't understand. This is a parable. I said, a parable to what? He said, you can't just read the Bible and understand it. The Bible is just parables. I said, okay, who understands it? No answer. Which denomination you belong to? None. I just go to different churches, get information from different sources. How, how do you identify truth from falsehood? No, no substantial answer. But anytime you present something that is clear cut, the answer could be, well, you just, you're reading into the Bible, you're trying to understand the Bible your own way. So wh what are we supposed to do with the Bible then if we can just read it and understand it? If someone said repent, why would I want to enter into this area and try to find some twist to it when we don't have anything else from Jesus saying the opposite, but we do have other people saying this about Jesus? That's why we Muslims are very particular about this. I love what he said. And we Muslims don't deny the Bible. We don't deny the credibility of the Bible altogether. We have issues with areas of the Bible because the Bible has issues. And I'm going to read the quotation from the source. In the introduction of the New Revised Standard Version, it says, uh, and this is a Bible by Oxford, Oxford Press, not uh, Islamic Society of, you know, Nottingham. It says, occasionally, it is evident that the text has suffered in the transmission that none, none of the versions provides a satisfactory restoration. This is a, a Christian source. With all the things they've gone through, they found so many issues, so many contradictions, so many revisions, so many insertions, so many deletions, so many alterations, that they can't even get to the source, the ultimate source of it. When we in turn tell you, come check out this Qur'an that has been preserved by God in the language of revelation for 1400 years. Not in a scripture. We don't need the book. I don't think anyone on earth can say this but us. 
Not even books of medicine with the most prolific doctors can claim that I have committed this book to memory from, from cover to cover. The only people on earth who can say this confidently and not like five or ten. How many do we have? Hundreds of thousands, millions of Muslims who are not even Arabs. Arabic is not their mother language. In fact, they may not even speak Arabic in terms of conversational Arabic. They don't know how to have a communication with you in Arabic. They've memorized more than 600 pages of divine revelation in that language. To the point of the diacritical signs, meaning the a u e pronunciation is known by these people. So that if the people came and removed all the Qur'ans from the world, they burned them down to the ground. We have no problem. We will call Mr. Bashir and we will call a couple of young kids from the local masjid, 10 year old, 9 year old, say please come over here, begin and we'll tell you Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. If he says ah, someone will tell him ooh. Not someone, everybody will correct him. If he made a mistake in even a sound and a vowel, not a big vowel, a small vowel. And we will be able to inscribe the Quran once again, scribe it once again, and the next day it is published and back in the bookstores. Who can say this? Who else can say this? Which book on this planet can say this? None. So we have an issue when Jesus says something and then someone else is going to quote something that Paul said in the letter he sent to uh, whoever about Jesus. No, no, we take offense to that. Anyways, and it also says in the Bible about repentance, and Jesus answered and said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Again, a straightforward, clear-cut, direct statement from Jesus about the means for sins to be forgiven, repentance. But if a wicked man turns from all his sins, which he has committed, keeps all my statutes, and does what is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, so that inequity will not be your ruin. Consistency in the biblical teachings, whether it is the Old Testament or the New Testament, there's consistency in how you get your sins forgiven. Notice that the death of Jesus is not part of it, or accepting Him as Lord and Savior is not part of it either. And this is not coincidental, nor is it miraculous. It's pretty straightforward. Now, of course, of course, in Islam, we have the same exact teachings. The consistency between the Bible and the Quran. Allah says, فَتَلَقَّ آدَمُ مِنْ رَبِّهِ كَلِمَاتٍ فَتَابَ عَلَيْهِ إِنَّهُ هُوَ التَّوَابُ الرَّحِيمُ In the context of Adam and Eve disobeying God, God says, then Adam received from his Lord some words of reprimand. Adam was reprimanded. Allah told him, did I not tell you not to approach this tree? Did I not tell you to stay away from this tree? And they said, رَبَّنَا ظَلَمْنَا أَنفُسَنَا Then Adam and Eve both said, Our Lord, we have wronged ourselves. وَإِن لَمْ تَغْفِرْ لَنَا وَتَرْحَمْنَا If you don't forgive us and have mercy on us, لَنَكُونَنَّ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ We will surely be among the losers. And God in Islam is so loving and merciful, as opposed to what people say about Him, that He had no issue with that. He had no issue with accepting that request from them, and he actually forgave them. Versus the Christian concept of God not accepting. And then that sin multiplying and multiplying and multiplying. For years, hundreds of years, it was multiplying. Until the sin became so humongous that even for God's standards himself, the only way to fix it was a divine sacrifice. Where somehow God became himself. God became a man. And the son of man, he became God, Jesus was God, and the son of God, simultaneously, somehow. Then he had to go through a very difficult process of humiliation, so that he would be crucified, so that he suffers. And then all you have to do is say, alright, thank you so much, I accept your Lord and Savior, woo, go to paradise. Wow. That's simply how it's put. If you want to look at it in the simplest way, this is all that there is to it. Anything else is additional. You want to be a good Christian, you want to be charitable, you want to go to church every Sunday, that's wonderful. 
But if you say that accepting Jesus as Lord and Savior means your sins have been forgiven, then why would you have to do anything else? If you say no, you have to do something else, now you've contradicted yourself that your sins have been forgiven. So there's really no escape from that. Indeed, he is he who accepts repentance, the merciful. So our position on God is that he was merciful. He accepted their repentance. Again, O oh son of Adam, this is the Hadith Qudsi, which means it's the, it's the uh, words of Allah narrated by the Prophet, peace be upon him, but it's not in the Quran. It's not a revelation. It is a tradition from the Prophet himself. He, Allah says, O oh son of Adam, so long as you call upon me and ask of me, I shall forgive you for what you have done and I shall not mind. O oh son of Adam, were your sins to reach the clouds of the sky? And were you then to ask forgiveness of me? I would forgive you. O oh son of Adam, were you to come to me with sins nearly as great as the earth? And were you then to face me, ascribing no partner to me? I would bring you forgiveness nearly as great as it. I can't find anything more soothing and comforting for my sinful self than this. If I wanted a Lord for those who have a problem with the Lord, people have a problem with Allah, why does Allah do this? Why does Allah do that? If you have a problem with Allah, I can't think of any better Allah. I can't think of anything better than what God says Himself. What else do we want? He told us the do's and the don'ts. And we still violate and we do what we shouldn't and we don't do what we should. And knowing that, he tells us, no problem. It's not an invitation for sinfulness, but it's comforting to know that we have a Lord that is willing to forgive us in spite of our shortcomings and transgressions. Another means in Islam for sins to be forgiven, and this addresses the issue of evil, so I can answer the question of the gentleman or the lady yesterday. Why does evil exist or how do we deal with evil? Then we understand that there are benefits in evil. Meaning if evil didn't, if, if things that contradict each other didn't exist, you wouldn't appreciate things. If everybody was short, then you wouldn't think they're short until you see a tall person. So when you see opposites, opposites show you and make you appreciate the other thing which you could have been negligent or careless about. Allah says, وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَقْصٍ مِّنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ And we will surely test you with something, something, not your whole life, something of fear and hunger and a loss of wealth and lives and fruits. But give good tidings to the patient. Meaning, if one of us is sinful and we're not, we're sinning so much that even our efforts to seek forgiveness are not sufficient for God, then a calamity might strike one of us that will serve to expiate the sin in this worldly life so that you don't have to pay for it on the day of judgment. So if you look at evil from this perspective, because in our mind, any calamity is evil. If you look at it from this perspective, actually, I would rather pay for my sin now and get it over with, as they say, than have to deal with it on the day of judgment. Similarly, if somebody told you, would you like to take your exams every semester? Or would you like to compile all of them after five years of study, you take all the exams in one shot? I don't think anyone would say, oh, I'll take all of them in one shot. That's a lot of studying for you to do. It's a lot of information that you have to retain. You would say, I'll deal with it one by one. I mean, just deal with it one by one. So we would rather deal with it now than having to deal with it on the day of judgment. Allah also, the Prophet also said, may Allah exalt his mention, trials will continue to befall the believing man or woman in himself, his child and his wealth until he meets Allah with no sin on him. So calamities actually serve to cleanse and clean and purify the believer from the, from the sins that he is committing. Good deeds erase bad deeds in Islam. إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا فَأُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ oh, yeah. فَأُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتٍ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا Except for those who repent, believe and do righteous work, then for them Allah will replace their evil deeds with good. And ever is Allah forgiving and merciful. So we learn in Islam, if you have sins and you want to get rid of them, you do good deeds. You do good deeds. Good deeds erase bad deeds. 
And the beauty of Islam is that by default, and that's something that businesses don't do. If businesses did this, we would all be like the happiest consumers on earth. In Islam, by default, each good deed is automatically multiplied by how many? Y'all don't know? Ten. Thank you. Ten. Minimum. Min the bare minimum is ten. That could go up to 70, 700, 7,000. That's not, none of our business. But the bare minimum of one good deed is ten good deeds. And one sin is equal to one sin. Don't be funny now. The reason why I'm saying this is because people want to do the math. So like you're walking down the street, there's a grocery store and there's a beggar. You say, all right, I'll steal some stuff. And then that's one evil deed. I'll walk over to Fulan, say, here you go, man. That's 10 good deeds. I'm still good with nine. No. It doesn't work this way. Because the ends don't justify the means. And in Islam, your deed has to be pure. That deed is based on theft. And so it's already the foundation is corrupt. Therefore, you can't expect any good deeds for that. Similarly in Islam, for those who get riba, for those who get interest, you get interest money from the bank, which you shouldn't. But let's say you, you couldn't find a bank account that doesn't give you an account that is free of interest. You can't get this money and then say, I'm going to go give it as charity. Because that money in Islam is unlawful. And so God will not accept it. The scholars say, if you do have this kind of money, you should use it for public services, building bathrooms, you know, roads, bridges, but it can be used as a mean or deed for you to get nearer to God. Again, other ayat, إِنَّ الْحَسَنَاتِ يُذِبْنَ سَيَّاتِ Verily, the good deeds remove the evil deeds. Then, of course, the, the most important, the most important thing for you to get your sins forgiven is, as opposed to accepting Jesus as Lord and Savior, is believing in the oneness of Allah. Allah says in the Quran, إن الله لا يغفر أن يشرك به ويغفر ما دون ذلك لمن يشاء وما يشرك بالله فقد ضل ضلالا بعيدا Verily, indeed Allah does not forgive association with him but he forgives what is less than that for whom he wills and he who associates others with Allah has certainly gone far astray So the, the unforgivable sin, quote unquote, the unforgivable sin for real the only one is not Metallica uh, Y'all don't even know Metallica, right? Because new generation, what do you guys call the millennials? Uh, the, only, uh, the only sin that is not forgiven is someone dying in the state of polytheism. Dying in the state where they are ascribing partners to God, worshipping someone else with God, denying God, not worshipping God to begin with. Any one of these elements where you're not on the straight path is technically a bad ending for a human being. And so... Believing in the oneness of God is among the most important means of sins to be forgiven. Then I'm going to give you a logical evidence. And the logical evidence is that you're an employee. And for whatever reason, like for example in my company, we have what we call the MD. The MD is like the Korean managing director, like the biggest guy in the company, right? The one who manages all departments. Then I have my line manager, the guy that I report to. And then my line manager reports to the head of department and the head of department reports to the MD. Are we clear or do I have to repeat myself? All right, cool. So imagine that I had this awesome relationship with the MD himself, which is the shot caller. Forget about your line manager, he's useless. Forget about the HOD, he's useless because they have to get approval from him for anything exceptional. The guy... I, oh, this is not the case, by the way. <laughs> Hypothetically, the guy likes me. Actually, we're good. We're good. Um, <laughs> no, but I'm saying, like, imagine if he liked me so much that he told me, Wajdi, come to my office. Listen, man, you're an exceptional employee. You're a brand ambassador. We're proud of you. Anything you want, you come and ask me directly. Because in our company, if I wanted to go on vacation to come to Malaysia for the DIW, I have to actually submit an approval that goes through all the people that have to approve in the line before the MD approves. That include HR and what have you. So imagine if I had this hookup with the MD who told me, don't even apply for anything on the system. Forget about the system. I got you. You want to go on vacation? You go with, this, with your salary paid. We're not even going to deduct from your vacation days, nor are we going to deduct from your, you know, from your salary. That would be awesome. 
And I'm like, all right, that's cool. Like, that's such a privilege. And then a week later, I get an email from Hazik, who says, uh, this year the DIW will be in March, whatever, 12th. And so like a retard, or sorry, some people are offended with this term, like an idiot, I go, yeah, I know, I've learned so many lessons in life. Like these expressions are not used in that sense, but yes, I take it back. Don't mean any offense to someone with disability. Like an idiot, I go on the system and I apply exactly in the manner in which the MD told me not to do. And then sure enough, when my line manager approves, and then the HOD approves, and then HR approves, when the MD opens his inbox and he sees a request from me, what in the world do you think he's going to think? This must be the dumbest employee in the world. I told this creature that he can come to me. And then he insists on going through the traditional system wherein he's going to lose money or lose vacation days. He must be insane. You know what? Not only I don't like him anymore, I want to fire this guy. Like if I were the MD, I would fire this guy. I'll be so irritated that this is so annoying, I would just let go of him. You're just... Ugh. You shouldn't even be in this company. You're, you don't have enough intelligence to work here. And people realize, don't realize that we have this direct line with God. You have a God that is telling you constantly, as we saw in the presentation yesterday by Brother Sabur. Allah tells us in the Quran, Ud'uni astajib lakum, call on me, I will answer you. And we're like, nope, thank you so much. Let me go find someone in this world who will deliver information on my behalf. Let me find an intercessor. Let me find an idol. Let me find a statue. Let me find a sub-god. Let me find a son of God. Let me find a mother of God. They, why do we have to find someone when God is telling you, you don't got to find anybody, you already got me. It is, it is crazy, it's crazy that we insist on bypassing that direct relationship and trying to find an intermediary. It's crazy. While we have this access to God, and it's not like it's a manager, it's God Himself, man. That is so awesome. And I believe this is the most virtuous teaching of Islam, hands down. You can argue about Islam for years, and you could say all the misconceptions about Islam. Women have to wear hijab, women have to stay blah blah, women this, you, got, you can mention all the problems. But you can never come close or touch upon this. This is the one thing that distinguishes us truly from any other faith, which whether they tell you directly or not, bottom line, you will find someone else in between you and God. You can almost never go directly. You can almost never go directly unless it's a very philosophical issue. That yeah, well, they're not God, but they're a point of focus. And so we use them as this. I've talked to many Hindus and many Buddhists. It, just, it, it didn't make sense. Why do I have to have Brahma and, and Shiva and all? Why? Why? What, are these, what is their role if there's one ultimate God? So Islam takes you straight to the source through clear-cut textual evidence. That is the logical relationship between a creator and a creation. So, so far we have consistency between the Bible, the Quran, and what I perceive to be logic. Redemption by crucifixion. The belief that the death of the Son of God on the cross atoned for the original sin that man inherited from Adam and that salvation may be attained by believing in Jesus as the Lord and Savior and that I've mentioned already. Now we're going to look at it from a deeper point of view. Biblical evidences which contradict this teaching. Fathers shall not be put to death for their children. Nor shall the children be put to death for their fathers. A person shall be put to death for his own sin. And so here, as opposed to what we saw earlier, now we're talking about if someone had to die for someone else. That you cannot kill someone because of the sin of someone else. If someone sinned and that sin requires capital punishment. And for the record, in the, te the, the teachings of Christianity, you can get killed for many things. But you, they don't tell you that. If you had an animal and this animal were to attack someone and kill them, according to the biblical teachings in the Old Testament, you and your animal should be killed. You can research this later. If you violate your parents verbally, if you curse out your parents, you should be put to death. 
The number of things that can cause the death sentence in the Old Testament are way too many for you to believe. Once done, go on Google and put capital punishment or death sentence according to Christianity. And whatever first five, six links you will get, all of them will, go, will show you the exact reference in English that you understand where in the Bible it teaches that all of these things can put you to death. And so people that criticize Islam for certain things where Islam has to go through so many phases and steps before you reach that point to prove it, in Christianity it's much simpler than that. Either way, that contradicts that teaching of Christianity also. As I said earlier, you'll find a lot of contradictions in the Bible. Islamic evidence, وَقَوْلِهِمْ إِنَّا قَتَلْنَا الْمَسِيحَ عِيسَى بْنَ مَرْيَمْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا صَلَبُوهُ وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَ لَهُمْ وَإِنَّ الَّذِينَ اخْتَلَفُوا فِيهِ لَفِي شَكٍّ مِّنْهُ مَا لَهُمْ بِهِ مِنْ عِلْمٍ إِلَّا اتِّبَاعَ الظَّنْ وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ يَقِينًا Allah says, and for their saying, Allah in this context, in these verses, He is criticizing the Christians, the people of the book. And among the things that God criticized them for was, and for their saying, indeed we have killed the Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. Because even then, they were calling Him the messenger of Allah. And they did not kill Him, nor did they crucify Him. But it was made to appear like that to them. And indeed, those who differ over it are in doubt about it. They have no knowledge of it except the following of assumption. And that is true. Don't believe me. Go on YouTube and watch debates between Bart Ehrman, an ex-Christian, and devoted Christians on the topic of the crucifixion of Jesus. And you will not believe what type of debates exist internally between Christians about that very concept. If you read the narratives in the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, you will find the, um, if you put them just side by side and you read them, there will be so many discrepancies, you don't know what to believe anymore. Did the people stay around him? Did they leave him? What did he say on the cross? If, if Jesus willingly, willingly he wanted to die for all of us, why in the world would he have to put on an act on the cross and say, Ally, ally, lima sabachtani. God, God, why have you forsaken me? What would be the logical reason behind Jesus complaining about being forsaken by God if he was the sheep who offered himself for the salvation of the rest? When you read the various versions of the story, you will find plenty of contradictions in the story. And that's exactly what Allah is referring to. They have no, no real information. It's all a bunch of doubt. It's all based on assumptions. They don't know what they're saying. What we do know for a fact, what we do know for a fact is that Jesus was not crucified. And every Muslim in the world believes that Jesus was not crucified. Rather, as Allah says, and they did not kill him for certain, Watch the next ayah. بَلْ رَفَعَهُ اللَّهُ إِلَيْهِ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ عَزِيزًا حَكِيمًا Rather, Allah raised him to himself. And ever is Allah exalted in might and wisdom. Allah is the most wise. So, because this is a messenger of God, he was in a moment of need, God saved him. Restarting. It's okay. It's in my mind. No issue. God saved him as opposed to letting him be killed by criminals. And so the interesting thing is, as a Muslim, not only we believe he was raised, but we also believe that he will return. Another miracle of Jesus that Christians are not aware of is that he is the only human being whom we believe has not yet died. We believe every human being from the time of Adam until now has died except Jesus, the son of Mary. Why? Allah raised him to himself. What's the purpose? Because the day of judgment will not occur until Jesus returns. The day of judgment will not take place until the false Messiah presents himself before the people, he plays with their minds, he does miracles, the fool, the weak-hearted, the hypocrites, the people with little faith, they will be mesmerized with his actions and they will follow him. But 
only those who believe firmly will be saved and then Jesus himself will kill the false messiah. Then there will be peace on earth like we've never experienced ever in our lives. And when all that is said and done, then there will be the day of judgment. Then will be the day of resurrection. So Islam not only believes in God saving Jesus, which is the logical thing to happen, it also believes that Jesus is alive right now as we speak, and it also believes that Jesus must return, and that he is from the major signs of the last day. How in the world can you think that Islam is against Christianity? How? Please name another faith on earth that gives Jesus this virtue. I would like you to speak to the average Jew who will tell you he was a liar and an imposter. Speak to a Buddhist, speak to a Hindu, speak to an atheist. These figures to them make no difference. Jesus matters not to them. The only people that are passionate about Jesus, and not because my mother told me, because it's in the revelation which we follow, are the Muslims. And I find that extremely useful. It's extremely useful for you to identify this reality when, when understanding our perspective. That's why don't be offended. Don't be offended because we aim to correct the errors and the lies attributed to Jesus. The objective behind this presentation, which is currently unavailable, and any other presentation is to correct the lies that the people have attributed to Jesus. And once we're back, I will show you the uh, progress. How did it start? Who was involved? Were politics involved? Are there any paganism? Is there any paganism, paganism involved in, in what, most, what Christians today believe about Jesus? All of it is based on idolatry and paganism. Because the Romans were, were, were idolaters. And so they wanted to kind of meet in the middle. So they brought the Christians and struck a deal and came up with ideologies and philosophies. And then they, made, they enforced them in their states. It's not like it was up to you. No, they made them obligatory on the people of that country to accept that. And if they didn't, they were persecuted and they were killed and murdered. It was a major political movement based on paganism. And today it is accepted, endorsed, and, and promoted. And, and missionaries go all over the world, especially the Muslim world. Where Muslims might be suffering because of lack of nutrition, or lack of food. And then unfortunately they capitalize on their weakness to try to promote you know, something about Jesus. Because they know that we have, we have feelings for him. We, he exists in our lives. This is of course if I were to remove the crusaders from the picture who went to countries like the Philippines and enforced Christianity upon the Philippines, which was a Muslim country. Only people in Mindanao kind of stuck to the deen. And they, they adhered. Others, you know, people being persecuted, a person will say anything. If someone put a gun to your head and say, uh, you know, say that I hate Nottingham University. Now you say it a million times. Most of you will say it anyways. <laughs> now if someone said, curse your mother. Say that your mother is whatever word. You would say it. Say, just don't shoot me, man. So obviously when people are, are being threatened with their lives, they might, they'll change anything if they, don't have, if they don't have strong faith. And so that impacted the world. And today when we try to speak about these matters, about Islam, we are looked at as, you know, we are the ones who are enforcing and we are the ones who are violent and we are the ones who are aggressive. But people have... As uh, Mr. Ahmed uh, mentioned yesterday, people have no knowledge of history, no, no historical background or anything. They watch a YouTube video and then they come with, with information that you think makes any sense, but it doesn't. And the discussion we had today with this young man, I don't know if he's here, is he here? Anthony? He's not here. I would like him to be here because it was interesting, it was interesting the conversation we had. And ironically, <laughs> he was sitting there and we're having a nice dialogue. Then someone brought another Christian. And they said, I said, please, please join us in the conversation. And so now they're both sitting next to each other. I know I'm, I'm extending this because of this. So bear with me. But it's interesting because they're all relevant. So this other guy sat down 
And I was just discussing with this gentleman, the first one, about the issue of parable. I don't understand what you mean that I can't say Jesus said this because that doesn't mean what it says. It means something else because I'm stupid. I couldn't understand it. I'm not getting the whole thing. So he told me, look, look, watch. He asked the guy next to him, do you believe in the hellfire? What do you think the guy said? He said, yes. He said, do you believe it exists now? He told him, yes. He said, do you believe that it's, 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 it's there? There's a hellfire. He said, yes. He said, see, there's no hellfire. I said, what? He said, this is an example of a parable. I said, yes, sheikh. <laughs> and uh, you want to blow my mind or what? You're giving me a classic example of how there's so much contradiction that y'all two can't even agree on something. He's like, that's what I'm telling you. It's a parable. It's really the fire will come on the last day and it's the not being in the presence of God and it's not really physical hellfire. It's not a physical hellfire. It's a hellfire in a sense that you are not one with God. There isn't a physical existence of a flame where you will burn in. And that was two individuals sitting next to each other trying to promote their religion and I'm sitting here like, okay, now which one am I supposed to believe? How do I know? How do you know? I asked the guy, okay, I understand. Maybe you're right. Explain further. How do you figure it out? He said, I go to different churches. I said, okay. He said, I listen to what they have to say and now I have a more broad idea of things. I said, okay, how do you determine the right from wrong? You're a student, right? You're a seeker of knowledge. Does the seeker of knowledge educate the educator? Um, no. If you knew, you wouldn't go. If you went, you're trying to learn. And so you as a recipient, how do you determine whether what he said is right or what he said is right? How do you make that judgment? Ladies and gentlemen, we couldn't get an answer. We could not get an answer. And that is the very point I'm trying to highlight is that such confusion is understandable when you don't have much to refer to or when your reference has been distorted. Whereas in the Quranic context, all of these issues are explained in the most straightforward, in the most pleasing way. God explained, describe the hellfire, describe the trees in the hellfire, describe the flames of the hellfire. Describe the punishment in the hellfire, the levels of the hellfire, the names of the levels in the hellfire. So that you'll be scared of the hellfire. So that you won't come on the day of judgment and say, wait, wait, where did this come from? I had no idea. No one can come and say, I didn't know. It was made very clear. And the same goes to paradise. And the same goes to everything that you need to know about Islam. It's before you, straightforward. Seriously? Should we have the Q&A session now? How many Christians do we have here? Nice. Alright, Muslims, you know what to do. <laughs> They're like, what, huh? I gotta go. Don't worry, we're nice. We good? All right. Now the logical evidence. The whole idea that God couldn't forgive and therefore he had to have this divine sacrifice resembles the following story. Of course, it's a story I came up with on my own. Uh, so if it doesn't make sense to you, I would understand. If you don't like it, I will also understand. Some may relate to it, some may not. But... What, when I look into the textual evidences, I understand them in this manner. There was a bank owner who was well off, who had a large staff of employees, and one of the employees was his loyal son, his actual biological son, whom he loved dearly. This bank owner had a friend who was corrupt. Corrupt in a sense that he, was, he had the habit of borrowing money and never paying back. And he had done it so many times that the bank owner kind of learned his lesson, said, you know what? Forget about this friendship. I'm sick and tired of this guy. Next time he asks for money, he's getting none. So, uh, sure enough, time passed and this man came 
and told him, told the bank owner, can I borrow some money from you? He told him, my friend, you know that you mean so much to me. You're a dear friend of mine for the last 20 years. But honestly, I'm tired of giving you money and you never paying back. So I apologize. Respectfully, I cannot lend you any money. And instead of that friend being cool about this and accepting it, he freaked out. And he panicked and started overreacting and said, how could you do this? What kind of friend are you? You're fake. I hate you. You know what? Forget you. I am entitled to get a loan. I can get a loan from a bank. And guess what? Legally, I'm going to go to your bank. I have the right to go to your bank and get a loan. So whether you like it or not, I'm still going to take this money from you. Pretty spiteful. So the man says, all right, do what you can. As soon as the friend leaves, the bank owner calls on to the staff, says, listen, he narrates the story to them and he tells them specifically, when he comes in, do not lend him money. Don't make it happen. Is it clear? Everybody understands? Everybody understands. Not you guys. <laughs> that was supposed to be the staff. <laughs> but I'm glad that you also understand. So this guy was like, yeah, bingo, don't worry, we got you. Got you back. You're the nicest bank owner, the best mudir ever. We're going to make it happen. A few hours later, this funny man comes into the bank and he goes to the teller. Uh, and then he puts on a major dramatical Hollywood, Bollywood style act of my mother is dying and I'm in dire need for money. And if I don't get the money right now, she will die and you will forever be blameworthy and this, this and that. So this compassionate employee sympathizes with him and decides he starts thinking about giving him the money. While this is happening, he's talking to the other staff. The son, the loyal son of the bank owner says, guys, you must be out of your mind. My father clearly told you that this is something that shouldn't happen and that you shouldn't lend this person money. And they're like, shh, shh, relax. We got it under control. He doesn't have to know. He will not know. We will strike a deal with this guy that he will take the loan and keep his mouth shut so that he doesn't expose us. He warns them twice, thrice, four times, nothing. In spite of him, they lend the guy the money and they ask him not to mention this to the bank owner because their necks are on the line now. But you're dealing with a jerk who as soon as he leaves the bank, he picks up the phone, calls the bank owner, say, guess what? I got the loan. What? I got the loan. Doesn't even have a conversation with him hangs up the phone, runs to the bank, calls for everybody. Guys, what happened? They say, um, we lend them the money. Where's my son? He's right there. You're fired. But that, you're fired. And in the Arabic tradition, takes off his shoe, <laughs> smacks him with it. Like That's the biggest insult. My mother was a sniper. You could be running around the house and she had like this homing slipper that would like fly into aisles and even if I'm in bed under the blanket, pfft, like, how, what the heck is this? I still have a cut here from a bad experience, but I deserved it. I was a bad, naughty kid. I love my mom. Of course, that was when I was crazy. Now we have a good relationship. She no longer hits me, uh, but that was besides the point. Anyways. So anyways, the father smacks him with a shoe and he insults him and he says, how much money did this guy take? They say $20,000. He says, all this money will be deducted from your salary for the next three years. And he kicks his son out of the bank. Then he turns around and he tells the staff, guys, I love you. I love you so much. I did this for you. This is my means of showing how much I appreciate you as my loyal staff by making him pay for what you have done. And if I were to tell you the story like I just did, you would never in your entire life think that this is okay. But when someone tells you, we sinned against God, God made a son of his own, which apparently he loved dearly. And then he made them suffer in this world. And then get arrested 
then crucified, humiliated, and as this, the narrative say, they used to they spat on Jesus as he was carrying his own cross. All of this humiliation, so that he can die and we can live. Now, while you try to find the, the way they the way it's narrated to us from a Christian point of view, is that this is the epitome of sacrifice, and that's cool because you are the beneficiary in this story. You're the one benefiting, so surely it sounds so cute and compassionate that God would do this. But from a logical point of view, wait a second. Why would God do this to His most beloved Son so we can get away with it? And all you have to do is accept that this happened and you're off the hook? Honestly, this is the easiest way to live your life. If you wanted the easiest, besides atheism, where they don't have to worry about anything, supposedly, because there's not even any accountability, the next in line in terms of simplicity and ease is the Christian concept of accepting Jesus as Lord and Savior. And depending on which Christian you speak with, those who are sincere and don't beat around the bush, they will have to admit at the end that yes, if I accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, am I off the hook? I accept Him, am I off the hook in spite of my sins? The bottom line is, while they try to add some obstacles, you are off the hook. You don't got to do anything. Pretty convenient. That is pretty convenient. And that contradicts the teachings of Jesus. And the teachings of Moses. And Abraham. And the Prophet Muhammad. And your parents. And your uncles. And your aunts. It's never been like this. We've never accepted this. Except in this context. So please, you know, think. Think on your own. Don't. It's very interesting the relevance between the lectures we're having. And wallahi, this is not planned. Meaning what I say has nothing to do with what the Ustad says. It's all just qadr of Allah. It's not a coincidence. It's the qadr of Allah. But there is such a connection because we use the same foundations. And it's just, it's just weird how things are happening. I was referring to this Stephen Hawking guy the day before he passed away. When I said someone himself is disabled and he's telling you this and that. And I was referring to him. Wallahi, in my mind I was speaking about him. And the next day he passed away. And I'm not saying that I have some special power. And if I tell you, son, say your name, that you're going to die tomorrow. Some of you will freak out. Imagine if I use this against you. I just mentioned a couple of brothers and they're like all night. They're like this. They can't sleep. No, no, it's not like that. But it's honestly, there's the, I believe these are divine signs. Divine signs that we're seeing before our eyes. The connection. Don't be a sheep. Because if you're just going to believe whatever is told to you, whether it is your parents, whether it is the, the bishop, the priest, uh, the pastor, whoever, the church, uh, books that are written. If you're just going to believe what people say, you will never make it to your salvation. You will never make it to the land of peace. Because there are so much going on, so many opinions. That's why we are so proud to tell you, you don't even have to listen to a man. Read the book of God. Read the Quran. Connect directly with your creator ignore the creation the only person you have an obligation towards is the messenger of god so you can have a living example among men not a son of god that's that's such a powerful reality that people are not mindful of trinity the most interesting of all is the belief that there are three persons please please for english speakers and that's like my major i'm a, I'm a terrible linguist but still that's my field and for mathematicians, and I'm a horrible mathematician, but I want you to focus on some of the grammar and some of the math, and tell me if these, these things add up. There are three persons in one Godhead. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they are co-equal, co-eternal, one in essence, nature, power, action, and will. That is the actual definition of Trinity from Christian resources. And depending on which Christian you speak with, you can go through mountains and valleys in discussing it. But the crux of the matter is this is what Trinity is. That you, they have to admit that they're co-equal, co-eternal, co-existent. If they don't, then there's a serious flaw in what they believe. Now, in the Bible it says, you have heard me say to you, I'm going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said, I'm going to the Father, 
for my father is greater than I. The first comment I have is on the term father. Now you can choose to believe that Jesus is the biological son of God. And if you were to do so, then you are technically insinuating that God must have had a physical relationship with Mary so that they would be a begotten son of God. That is option number one. Option number two, that this is a figurative language, just like an old man will say to me, my son, can you please pass me this bottle of water? No one over here is going to stand and say, oh, he must be his son. People will understand contextually that this is a statement in reference to uh, seniority or for respect or things of this nature. Naturally, a father is the caretaker. And so in that language, which Islam prohibits now, but back then, that term was used. Not to refer to a begotten son, because we will see in other verses from the Bible why this could never be the case. Until we get there, focus with me on the statement, my father is greater than I. So if I have access to a statement from Jesus where he is saying, my father is greater than I, as a Muslim, I will never dare to tell him, thank you for that statement. However, the church says you and the father are co-equal. Which do you believe? Who do you trust? Who should, who should, whose word should matter and, and affect you the most? I, as a Muslim, by all means, I find this statement very satisfactory. And because it's not from the Quran, it's even more satisfactory. That there's a biblical verse explicitly saying, My father is greater, greater than I. You can't be greater and co-equal. If you're equal, you're equal. There's no more greater. And then this is not in Old Testament, this is in the New Testament. In John chapter 14, verse 28. Then another interesting reality about Jesus being co-equal with God is that Jesus said, I of myself can do nothing. And I'm very interested in meeting a God who knows nothing or who cannot do anything. If God cannot do anything of himself, then by definition, he is no longer God. So now we have to fetch for a God. If we are believing in a God, then God is absolute and absolutely he can do whatever he wants. So when Jesus says, I of myself can do nothing, as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous. Which means also that I don't know the unseen. Meaning if two people came to Jesus disputing, it's not like he knows what happened in the past, present, and future so that he can, he can say, ah, you're lying to me. He says, as I hear, I judge. You bring an issue to me, I listen to you, I weigh the matter, and then I judge accordingly. But don't think that I'm going to take sides because he's my cousin, he's my nephew, he's my uncle, he's my relative. I'm not that type of person. My judgment is righteous. Why is it righteous, O Jesus? But because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. <laughs> Where did you go? There you go. John 5.30. Just, just take 20 seconds to read this on your own and, and digest it. The will of the Father who sent me because you send messengers. Versus you beget a son. And then the fact that he's not trying to do anything independent, he's only trying to do the will of God, which is exactly what we Muslims believe. If I wanted to summarize the Islamic belief about Jesus, I can easily say, here it is. The Bible tells you who Jesus is in Islam. Not just the Quran, the Quran tells you plenty. It tells you a lot more. But that in and of itself is sufficient. How about this? Day of judgment. Should not God know about the day of judgment? If God does not know about the day of judgment, then we have a serious issue. Because when is it going to happen? If God himself is unaware. So Jesus is God, or the Son of God, co-equal with his Father, co-existent with his Father. He had an issue. It says, but of that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the father. That's exactly what Muslims believe. A man came to the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, when is the hour? He said, what have you prepared for it? 
He, did, he does not know where the hour. Allah in the Quran says, يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ السَّاعَةِ أَيَّانَ مُرْسَاهَا فِيمَا أَنْتَ مِنْ ذِكْرَاهَا They ask you about the hour. When will it be? What position do you have to tell them? This is Allah addressing His Messenger. In spite of His, uh, his position, His status among the Muslims, Allah told them, Who, what position do you have to tell them about the last day? No one knows about the hour except God. So Jesus and Muhammad, peace be upon them, were preaching the same identical message. But today, we are told to reject both and believe that somehow Jesus is God and as God, He should know when the last day. Therefore, now I have to reject the Bible and reject the Quran and accept some Joe, some guy. Ironically, ironically, a person who himself used to persecute the Christians, then somehow, miraculously, conveniently, he was on his way from Damascus and Jesus appeared before him and he reprimanded him for doing this and he became the apostle of Jesus and there comes Paul, Saint Paul, who changed everything in Christianity. And Christianity is based on the teachings of Paul, not the teachings of Jesus. But Christians are not told this information because that's too dangerous. If they knew, they might leave. But I'm telling you, it's okay to leave. Because you're not leaving Jesus. You're leaving the false attri attributes and accusations against Jesus. You will still have to believe in Him in a more accurate, more particular, more beloved way to Allah. And that is the ultimate salvation. There are arguments. I'm going to mention the arguments and the counter argument. Some say that in John 10.30 it says, I and my father are one. So they're like, ha ha, we caught you. And the Christians love to bring this up when you bring John 5.30. But they never give you the context. Do you know the context? It says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they also may be one in us. First of all, the context before this was that Jesus was saying, when, God, when the sheep follow him, they are in his hand. When his followers come with him, they are in his hand. So they will not leave. And therefore, when they are with God, they will not leave. I and my father are one, as in, in purpose. Meaning my purpose and the purpose of God is that once my followers are with me, they don't abandon me and leave me. They retain their faith. And it is not that they are one in the context. If they were one, as in co-equal, co-eternal, then guess what? But now everybody is also one with God and Jesus. So now the meaning became everybody is God. God is God, Jesus is God, and every Tom, Dick, and Harry back then was also a God. So when you want to cite the Bible, even for myself, it is fair that you mention the context. And if you read the context of Gen John 10.30, you can no longer read this on its own as, oh, it means that they are one and the same. And if you say, you are a liar, you are a blatant liar, I will say, thank you so much. Okay, the least I could say now is that your Bible is contradictory. It's contradicting itself. We just read the Father is greater than I. Now we're saying I and the Father are one. Which one do I take? The bare minimum. If you say that I am misquoting, misciting the Bible for some ulterior motives of mine, because I'm a wicked creature, the least I could say to you is, fine. But I cited another John for you that said that the Father is greater than I. So now somebody gives me two verses from the Bible. One that says I and my Father are one. And one that says... The Father is greater than I. Which one do you take? Oh, the one that is most practical? If you accept one, you reject in the other. And that's why we say, in spite of the beauty of the Bible, the Bible is not the preserved word of God. The least we could say is that it is not reliable. Did God leave us in complete chaos and confusion by not allowing the Bible to be preserved? No, He didn't. He sent the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, with new revelation, with corrections, and finally, because it would be the last message for mankind, it was preserved until the end of time. 1400 years is enough time for you to believe that it's preserved. If this happened 20 years ago, 
I could see you saying, all right, you know what, this is too soon. Give it a little bit, people will find a way to change the Quran. I would believe it. 1400 years is not enough for you to believe that nobody has been able to change the Quran? Don't you know that many attempts were made to alter the Quran? None of them were successful. Don't you know that Christians, like, uh, what's his name? Anis Shorosh, who is a Palestinian Arab Christian. He, American also. He, of course, uh, got together with a bunch of other Christians and they said, you know what, we're sick and tired of this Quran because the Quran claim, the Quran claims that if you doubt that this is from God, produce something like the Quran. Make something like the Quran. فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِّن مِثْلِهِ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ Produce a chapter like the Quran. If you are truthful, bring it. That's the challenge of the Quran, 1400 years. It's a living challenge. Living challenge. So they said, you know what, we're going to do this. And as soon as we do this, it's over for the Muslims. And Anis Shorosh, you can Google him, who of course was caught later for embezzlement and for stealing money from the church, but that's typical. He eventually, he brought these clowns together and they made the Furqan, ah, the, the Quran competitor. And he was happy when he was debating with Ahmad Didat, rahimahullah. So yeah, well now we're going to champion it. So we're going to read it on stage. And they used Arabic terminology that is of Christian nature, Yesu'ah, because in Ar among the Arabs, they don't call him Al-Masih, they call him Al-Masih, but the most common name of Jesus is Yesu' Al-Masih. So he wanted to be funny, and they made, like, he was reading so-called chapters from the Quran, and the best part about it is the crowd's reaction, was that they laughed. They thought it was humorous, and it ended there. Evidence that it failed, you don't know about the story. If that was a successful attempt to emulate the Quran, guess what? It would have reached you. The fact that you don't even know this happened shows you what a success, what a failure, what a tremendous failure this project was. That's the power of the Quran. It's for you to believe. If Jesus was in reality the begotten Son of God, then it followed that the Father must have existed before Him as in the Son. Therefore, there must have been a time where the Son, Jesus, did not exist. Since God, in essence, is eternal and ever existing, Jesus could not be of the same essence of God. Who came up with this? Arius from Alexandria, Egypt. What happened to him? They killed him. Because he caused a major problem in Christendom by using this logic, which obviously the church wasn't very fond of. They don't want someone to come and tell the people to think. For the most part, for the most part, it's like, don't question these things. It's a dogma. It's a dogmatic belief. Just accept it. And that's, that's a problematic. But logic says, how, how could this happen? How could you have come up with this idea? Let me show you the history. History of the Trinity. This is where it gets really wild. Okay? Buckle up. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is no other. This is a biblical teaching. I don't care what anyone says afterwards. If I read a statement that says, I am the Lord and there is no other, it's end of discussion. Don't try to tell me later, no, no, wait a second, wait a second, let me explain this to you. There is one, but there are three in one. There's the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, they co-equal, one was crucified. So when he died, God really didn't die because the Father was still managing everything. But if they're co-equal, then how did one die and how remain alive? Don't worry about that. Don't worry about that, just skip, skip. And every time I've had a dialogue with a Christian and I tried to get to the crux of the matter, never ever was it explained consistently, adequately. At some point you have to say, oh, it doesn't make sense, but okay, I will accept that. We Muslims tell you, no, rationalize. Ration this is a matter of heaven and hell. This is a matter of salvation. This is a matter of belief. You cannot be passive about this. You cannot be shallow about this. What do you mean it says in the Bible, I am the Lord and there's no other and somehow I have to accept someone else who represents God in some way. But now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. God is telling you there was nothing before and there will be nothing after. It's always been one God. Message of Islam. I even, I am the Lord and besides me there is no savior. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. How many Christians know this is in the Bible? I don't know. 
and besides me there's no savior you tell God no I want to see I want to see I would love to see this on the day of judgment but I would not want to I would be so sad wallah it's not like I'm gonna be like happy like you know spiteful like oh you deserve it I will be so sad I'll be so sad if I witness on the day of judgment that a Christian knew that his Bible said that besides me there's no savior and then they took someone else as a savior that conversation with God on the day of judgment would be very interesting please think about it it'll be a very interesting conversation to somehow justify to God how this verse didn't make sense to you this verse was abrogated this verse was a parable this verse was misinterpreted this verse was an creation of Muslims what you gonna say which one of these are you gonna say how are you going to justify this when you have it already ajib it's one of the most ajib things in the dunya 150 318 uh, uh, Greek philosophy was introduced as a result Arguments, discussions concerning these new philosophies on the nature of the Son Jesus in relationship to the Father sprouted. In 325, the famous Council of Nicaea resulted in the first uniform Christian doctrine called the Nicene Creed. History. This is not from Wajdi. This is not from the Islamic Society. This is not from my computer. This is from the Christian sources. Please any Christian who doesn't trust me and I would understand why you would be skeptical about what I say please research afterwards know for your own the council declared Abdurrahman that the father uh, that the father and son are one of the same substance and co-eternal who did this a bunch of people a bunch of people decided that Jesus and his father are co-equal disregarding all the biblical verses I cited to you earlier it gets better than this they forgot somebody the Holy Ghost so in 381 the Council of Constantinople the Council of Nicaea had not clarified the divinity of the Holy Spirit which is the third person of the Trinity it's like he was left out they were busy with other things it's understandable so by the end of the fourth century conveniently the Byzantine Emperor Theodosius issued a decree that the doctrine of the Trinity was to be the official state religion and that all subjects shall adhere to it. 400 years after Jesus, they make the Trinity the foundation of Christianity. If you don't believe in it, you're not really a Christian. You are a Unitarian Christian. If you're a Unitarian Christian and you go to the Catholic Church, you are the devil in church. You're a disbeliever in essence. And Unitarian Christians are the closest thing to Islam, really. Because there are denominations among Christianity who reject Jesus as God. Who believe that he's a messenger of God. But they don't accept Prophet Muhammad. That's an issue which we can discuss. But they are Unitarian Christians for a reason. They didn't bring this from their home. There's a reason why they didn't believe in all of this. Because it has history behind it. And so there you go. Now it's the three in one. The new Encyclopedia Britannica. 1976 says <laughs> neither the word Trinity nor the explicit doctrine as such appears in the New Testament nor did Jesus and his followers intend to contradict the Shema in the Old Testament what is the Shema Shema because Aramaic and, and Hebrew are sister languages to Arabic Shema from Shema Shema it's from hearing and that was the most famous declaration of Moses and the followers of Jesus. What did it ironically say? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This was in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. The doctrine developed gradually over several centuries and through many controversies. By the end of the 4th century, the doctor of the Trinity took substantially the form it has maintained ever since. From Encyclopedia Britannica. They are telling it to you flat out. Do people read this? This is dangerous information. It's best that you remain blind. It's best that you remain deaf. It's best that you don't know. Why? Easy shortcut. Jesus died for me. I accept him as Lord and Savior. Please don't sweat me with this. Don't waste my time. Don't make me think. Don't make me have to sacrifice. Don't make me have to pray five times a day. It's pretty cool to go to church on Sunday or not even go at all. 
It's pretty cool. And it's pretty cool to, to do whatever I want technically. Technically, there are very limited things that are prohibited in Christianity. Even the things which are prohibited are made lawful. In Christianity, you're not supposed to be eating pigs. Swine is forbidden. But it's okay because Paul thought it was okay. You, men are supposed to be circumcised. Nah, it's the circumcision of the heart. Skip that part. You know, all these lists of prohibitions that Jesus preached are sidelined. That nope, marginalized, not important, do what you want. The malish, homosexuality is an abomination unto the Lord. Nope. Now we got, you know, churches promoting it. It's okay. It's okay, no problem. It's all good. Whatever makes you happy. Whatever makes you happy. Self-expression. It's about self-expression. And humans are gullible. They're like, oh, okay, that's beautiful. Oh, I'm going to do this. Cool, you can do this. You can do this by all means. But on the day of judgment, I'm telling you, you got a problem. I swear to God, you have a problem on the day of judgment. Because you were not given this soul, this body, this vision, this hearing, this intellect for you just to make money, produce children, eat and defecate. You were not created for this. You would have been a cow. You were made as a human being. There was involvement of revelation. You have intellect. You have faculties for you to understand because that is the objective of life. And you can't come on the day of judgment act like you didn't know. Somehow, some way, God delivers his message to you. Sometime in your life, you will come in contact with the message and you make a choice. I accept or I reject. I will commit and comply or I will follow my desires. The Encyclopedia Americana, in case you don't like British people, here comes the Americans for you. Because some people are, you know, nationalists. The Brits. Americans are cool too. It says Christianity derived from Judaism and Judaism was strictly Unitarian, as in believing that God is one person. Fourth century Trinitarianism did not reflect accurately early Christian teaching regarding the nature of God. It was, on the contrary, a deviation from this teaching. So, in case you didn't see it, here it is. Again, consistency from historical references, from literature, from Christian writers, maybe non-Christian writers, whatever the case may be. It's not Muslims involved in this. They are telling you exactly how it is. Trinitarian belief was introduced after Jesus. Jesus didn't preach it. That's why God sent the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The true nature of Jesus. According to the Bible in Matthew, so the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Jesus was a prophet. And he said to them, what things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. Jesus was a prophet. Then in John, then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, This is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. And lastly, in Luke, Nevertheless, I must journey today, tomorrow, and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish outside of Jerusalem. Here, he is referring to himself as a prophet. I think if he really was for Trinity, if he really was for him being the Lord and Savior, that would have been a perfect time to say the Son of God, the begotten Son of God. And did you know that when they revised the Bible, the term begotten was removed? I want to give you the actual source. You know John 3.16, yeah? For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, it says in the RSV, is the, by the way, the RSV, the Revised Standard Version, is the 30, it had the work of 32 biblical Christian scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 cooperating Christian denominations. It was like a massive project. They produced the RSV in an effort to correct the many and serious errors that they had found in the King James Bible. And so, conveniently, when they went back to the original manuscripts in Greek, they found that the term begotten was not even there. There was another term used 
and I'm not, I don't speak Greek, so I may mispronounce this, but the Greek term for begotten is genau, genau, G-E-N-N-A-O. I hope I sounded Greek for a second. Uh, as in found, which is found in Matthew, for example. But the actual Greek word they found was monogenes, which meant unique. So they decided to remove the word begotten. And go check the Bible. You will find that in that version of the Bible, there is no begotten son of God. And by the way, that is technically the only reference about the concept of Jesus being the begotten son of God. And gone. Gone. What platform, foundation do you have to reject what Jesus said and accept what people are attributing to him? I'll tell you what the Islamic evidence says. I'm going to go to the English. Oh, people of the scripture, as in Jews and Christians, do not commit excess in your religion or say about Allah except the truth. The Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary, was but a messenger of Allah and his word, which he directed to Mary and a soul created at a command from him. So believe in Allah and his messengers. In another ayah, Allah said about Jesus and Mary, كَانَ يَأْكُلَانِ الطَّعَامِ Jesus and Mary used to eat food. And when you eat food, you have a digestive system. And when your system has done its work, at some point in time, you have to hit the bathroom. And how in the world can we say that God had to go to the bathroom? Please, reason, reason. If you say Jesus is God, and then God went to the bathroom, what type of God is that? The only explanation is because God couldn't explain himself well. He had to become human and come down to our level to show us. Seriously? God is so incapable, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the manufacturer, the originator of this, this amazing world we're living in, had an issue in exp explaining. Oh, don't you think he could have raised our IQ to understand when he created us? He could have. He made us dumb and then he had to go out of his way to, to things don't add up. They don't add up. Further, and do not say three. <laughs> the only place you'll find Trinity, if you go through, if you go to the Bible, download the application, download an, an application for the Bible, or go to the actual physical book and read it from the beginning till the end, you will not find the word Trinity. The word Trinity as is does not exist in the Bible. It could be someone's footnote, it could be someone's commentary, but it's not actually in the text of the Bible. The only place you find Trinity is in the Quran, in the context of rejection. Do not say three. Desist. It is better for you. Indeed, Allah is but one God. Exalted is He above having a son. To Him belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth, and sufficient is Allah as a disposer of affairs. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Allah does not need children, does not need to go out of His way, does not need a divine sacrifice, that all this hassle is not needed. It's simple. You sin, you repent, you're good to go. Very straightforward. The message of Moses, in case you didn't know, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Jesus said, because this is important, Moses was preaching, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Jesus said, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to change what Moses, the law was, the law was the Old Testament. Jesus is telling his followers who sometimes don't care, sometimes they don't care. He's telling them straight up, I did not come to abolish the law of Moses. You can disregard that, just the law. Or the prophets. Now you still have Moses because you agree with me that Moses came before Jesus. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth. Until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, nor the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Wow! Wow! How, how straightforward can you get? Jesus is telling you, look, you saw what Moses was teaching? I'm going to go by the book. You can't even change a letter. You know, a letter, you can't remove something and change it. Today, the Bible is freely, verses are removed, verses are inserted, footnotes, which were once footnotes, became part of the text. Then they discovered that these 
are not part of the text. They went back to footnotes. Then they didn't like the footnote. They removed the footnotes. They, go, they went through a process that is unbelievable. And no one knows it except people who care about the subject matter. You're not going to find this readily available for you. It has to be that God decrees for an event of this nature for someone to come and spell it out for you. I know you're going to hate my guts. I completely understand. I am the jerk who ruined your life. I completely understand. But still, the bottom line is you have been informed. I just want you to be informed because there's no other way for you to be informed. What do I get out of this? Do you think they're going to give me a trophy? Bravo, watch the, you did a great job. I don't care. There's no trophy involved. I simply care for fellow human beings. Any human being who walks the surface of this earth, I have an obligation towards him to inform him about the reality of this worldly life and the preparation for the life to come. In spite of my sins and my shortcomings and my erroneous approach or whatever you want to call it, still, I have this obligation. I do this out of love. I don't do this out of hatred. I speak passionately because I'm really... It, it drives me crazy that we can't communicate with humans and reach common grounds. I've had so many conversations with Christians. It hurts me deeply that you have evidences that are clear like the sun. And then they're looking at the sun, but they tell you, I can't see it. I can't see it. You can't see it or you don't want to see it. I don't know. If you were sincere, don't believe me. I tell you something, I'm not at the conclusion, but I'm going to include it now. Let's assume hypothetically that I am an imposter. I'm one of the false prophets that Jesus spoke about. I'm someone who's trying to deviate you from the path. I'm someone who's trying to take you away from Jesus. I'm someone who's going to destroy your source of salvation. I challenge you to ask God tonight. I challenge you to ask God, the, the creator. If this guy which presented the presentation today is a liar, make it evident to me and protect me from his nonsense. And if he's saying the truth, guide me to it. The sincere people will do this, most will be scared. Most will be scared when they're, they're supplicating to God that what they're asking for might come to them. And they might know already, but they don't want to come. They don't want to come. Why? Too many things to change. It's, it's a big deal to change religion. You have issues with the family, culture. You know, you have to start doing things that you weren't doing before. You have to let go of things that you love. But this world, your life is so beautiful. I want to enjoy it. You know what? Forget about this religion. All these Muslims are just crazy. Easy way out. For the most part, that's the reason why people don't, get, they don't come over after you share with them. Those who don't know, I excuse them. Wallah. Anyone who doesn't know, I say he doesn't know any better. How can you blame someone who's unknowing? Once they know... I don't understand why they don't come. Unless they have a stronger argument. And until now, in my humble experience, it hasn't arrived. If you have it, we'll have a discussion about it later. Whoever, the, Jesus continues to say, whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so, it's so ironic, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. If you break the least commandment, you're in trouble. Let alone the greatest commandment, which is here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. But whoever does and teaches them, whoever lives by the commandments, you all know the Ten Commandments, all the Christians know the Ten Commandments. What's the first commandment? Here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Did you know that this is the first commandment? I will repeat, what is the first commandment according to Jesus? Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our, our, pronoun, our, me, you. Not your, our God is one. Not me with him, I'm with him, we're co-equal. No, 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 no. Jesus was saying, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That is Islam. That is Islam in the first commandment. And Jesus said to you, if you violate the least of the commandment, not the greatest, you will be called the least in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of heaven, you have got no significance. People violate the first commandment and they think they're going straight to heaven. Guess what? Jesus has something to say about this too. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. You have to be more righteous than the people before you, than the Jews and the children of Israel. You have to be more righteous, you have to do more good deeds. Again, Islam. 
Jesus answered him. In case you were saying, oh, you're trying to trick us. You were quoting Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verse 4, which is what Moses said about the first commandment. Now you're going to get it. Jesus in Mark, chapter 12, verses 29 and 30. The same thing. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. This is Islam. But guess what? He said, now behold, one came said to him. This is an interesting incident in the life of Jesus. Someone came to Jesus and said, good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, why do you call me good? That's very interesting. If I were a God, God has to be proud. He has to be uh, powerful. It, God is not humble because it doesn't befit God to be humble. Humans have to be humble because we came from a semen drop. Humans have, have to be humble because we're incapable, we're deficient. God, the maker of humans, is not humble. So it doesn't make sense that God will say something like, don't call me good. So what are you supposed to call God? Evil? Jesus ironically said, why do you call me good? No one is good but one. That is God. But if you want to enter into the eternal life, guess what? He didn't tell him, accept me as Lord and Savior. Believe that I died for you on the cross. No. No, Jesus conveniently said, keep the commandments. What is the first commandment? There's only one God. Wow. Wow. This is all in the Bible, guys. This is in the Bible. People don't know. The, the, pre, the preacher on, in church is not going to quote these for you on Sunday. You think he's out of his mind? These are the ones that you never hear. And you will never hear because they're not practical for the objective. But, you know, somebody got to do this. It's a dirty job. Somebody got to do it. Jesus said to her, don't cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. Ironically, that's what we believe. But go for, to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. My God. You know how I was telling you the whole time, don't get stuck on the word father, because I know the Christians are going to catch me later and say, you're funny guy. Jesus is saying father the whole time. And you're denying the sonship of Jesus, but he said, father, there you have it. My father, your father, which means my God and your God. Thank you very much. Can't refute that. No need to clap. <laughs> and so Jesus is not going to call God his God if he was God. Allah says in the Quran, indeed, Allah, this is Allah quoting Jesus. This is Jesus saying, indeed, Allah is my Lord and your Lord. So worship Him. This is the straight path. This is the Bible. This is the Quran. This is the Bible. This is the Quran. Are you out of your mind? Really? Really? You don't see this? You don't see that Muslims are your friends and homies? Homies? Anyways. Now, for those who say, remember I told you to go ask God sincerely? I told you to go ask God sincerely. You're going to say about the false prophets. Check it out. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So people who just say, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord. He said, you calling me Lord is not going to get you into paradise. You want to get into paradise. According to Jesus, you have to do the will of God. Many will say to me in that day, Subhanallah, another miracle of the Quran. And, and the, from the Bible and in the Quran. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Cast out demons in your name? And done many wonders in your name? Because that's the only thing they say. Well, this person was sick and then in the name of Jesus, he was cured. He will say, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Jesus will not be interested in such claims. Just calling him Lord, doing things in his name. Because look, if you're going to base your belief, if you will base your belief on someone healing someone in the name of Jesus, then I'm going to bring someone who healed someone in the name of a tree. He says, in the name of the palm tree. And the guy gets up from the wheelchair and he's jumping around. Woo! You know how many of these people are actors, paid actors, that they bring them into these shows? Wallah, wallah, they discovered so many of them scams. 
all these miraculous uh, cures. Okay, he said in the name of the tree, guess what? You have to leave Jesus and believe in the tree. If your faith is going to be dependent on so-called miracles, in my country, Lebanon, there was a great miracle of Mother Mary. There was oil coming out of her eye. She was crying oil. It was an, a tremendous event. All it took is a couple of guys to do some research, and they found out that there was a leak in the wall. I swear to God. And the stories of like this are endless. So you can't base your belief on, in the name of Jesus, I do this, in the name of, Je I, in the name of my shoes, you know, whatever, and then something happens, all of you now have to believe in my shoes. Come on. God did not make us so naive that we're going to jump around religions and people depending on miracles in I don't know whose names. It has to be based on logic, rationalism, evidence, with things that you, you experience in your life. Not just somebody doing something crazy. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship Him. So God, which is His God, is telling you should worship God, not Jesus. This is in John. In the Quran, Allah will say, beware of the day when Allah will say, Oh Jesus, this is amazing. The correlation between the biblical teachings and the Islamic teachings are mind-blowing. Allah will say, Oh Jesus, son of Mary, did you say to the people, take me and my mother, because mother of God, Mary is the mother of God, hail Mary. Take me and my mother as deities besides Allah. I know not all Christians believe that Mary is divine, but some of them do. So in regards to that denomination, this verse comes. And he will say, exalted are you. It was not for me to say that which I have no right. If I had said it, you would have known it. You know what is within myself and I do not know what is within yourself. Indeed, it is you who is the knower of the unseen. So Jesus will deny having told anybody at any point to worship him. And ironically, if you search the whole Bible, not once will you find Jesus saying, I am God or worship me. Never will you find it like explicit. You will find, you know, words and stuff like that, that, that uh, St. Paul said about Jesus when he sent a letter to his, I don't know who. That's the only thing you will come close to. You will never find anything explicit from Jesus. That's why he will deny it. Then he will say, I said to them, I said not to them except what you commanded me. To worship Allah, my Lord and your Lord. And I was a witness over them as long as I was among them. But when you took me up to the heavens, you were the observer over them and you are over all things witness. For God so loved the world that he, this is the begotten son, which I told you, this is the refutation for that term, which I mentioned to you that was removed. This term begotten was removed from the revised version of the Bible because it is not there in the Greek manuscript. These are some misconceptions. The second misconception, for there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. Guess what? Guess what? Check this out. This verse is now universally recognized as being a later insertion of the church. And all recent versions of the Bible, such as the Revised Standard Version, the New Revised Standard Version, the New American Standard Bible, the New English Bible, and the Phillips Modern English Bible, all of them removed this verse from the Bible. Because it was never there in the original manuscript, somebody inserted it because it helps. It helps the works of the missionary. The missionaries love the... Uh, John uh, 3.16, and they love this. And both have a flaw. One has the word begotten, which is not there in the Greek manuscript. This one doesn't even belong in the Bible, guys. The only thing that may give you the insinuation of a trinity is an insertion into the Bible. Check the Christian sources. Check the Bible, you will not find it. All the ones I mentioned, you will not find it. And then another misconception. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. People say, okay, there you go. This is the evidence that Jesus is God. I say, are you kidding me? He said, I am the way, not the destination. God is the destination. The prophet is the way. Of course, at the time of Jesus, you could not be a believer if you didn't follow his way. Of course. 
You couldn't say, Jesus, no, thank you. I'm not interested in your message. I'm just going to believe in Moses and think you're going to God. No way on earth you would have made it to God because Jesus was the way and he was the truth and he was the life during his time. And no one could have access to God without Jesus during his time. So we don't deny that. He who has seen me has seen the Father. Another uh, misconception. Let me give you the context. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me? Philip, he who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? So Jesus simply told him that his own actions and miracles should be sufficient proof of his existence. And that's exactly what we Muslims believe. When we see the Prophet, when, when the believers saw the Prophet Muhammad, they asked for the same thing, show us God. And if God brought down himself from above the heavens and showed us himself, what virtue do you have for believing in him? What, what's so special about you when you saw God with your own eyes? Is there any virtue in believing? Absolutely not. For example, let's say I have money. I have money in my pocket. And I'm using my trust, the mutual trust that we have. If I told you, if I told one of the guys, look, I have 500 ringgits in my pocket. And he says, you know what? I swear to God that he has 500 ringgits. People say, but dude, you, you haven't seen it. So it doesn't matter. I know this guy. First of all, he doesn't joke. Second of all, he swore by God. I trust him. This is a serious context. I mean, we're not joking. We're not joking. If he says that he has 500 ringgits, I have firm belief without even seeing the money in his back pocket that he has it. That is virtuous. But if I showed you 500, said I have 500 ringgits, are you special for saying I believe you? It's in your face. People want to see the angels and they want to see heaven and they want to see hell and they want to see their soul and they want to see the life to come. Once you see all this, then what makes you special? What, what have you earned in terms of belief? Absolutely nothing. Then, then all of us are equal. There will be no point in the test. So Jesus was not referring to the fact that, and the evidence for that is John chapter 1 verse 18. It says, no one has seen God at any time. John 1 18. So if Jesus is saying here, if you've seen me, then you've seen the Father, how can he turn around and say, no one has ever seen God? Because supposedly he's God. That means someone saw God. So that would be another contradiction, assuming that that's what Jesus meant. But now I go away to him who sent me. The mission is not complete, by the way. Jesus' mission was not complete. And, uh, but, and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, Sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And the only one who could be referring to in this context, as we believe, is the Prophet Muhammad. If you want to say that this is the Holy Spirit, we go back to the contradiction of Trinity. If the Holy Spirit has always coexisted, then Jesus does not have to go to send anybody. The Holy Spirit is already there doing work. Why does he have to go for someone else to come? Because the only one who will fulfill the message of Jesus is the Prophet Muhammad. And that's exactly what he did. Now, ironically, and when he has come, he will convict the world of sin. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, however you want to define it, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. The Prophet Muhammad, in every chapter of the Quran, except one, it begins with, Bismillahir Rahman Rahim in the name of Allah. I'm speaking in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. And that is the description of Jesus of the Prophet Muhammad. And Allah says in the Quran, Wama yantiqu anil hawa. Muhammad never speaks of his own desire. In huwa illa wahyun yuha. It is only revelation we're sending to him. Jesus telling you, he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. This is why in the Quran, the Prophet Muhammad is reprimanded. 
If he was the author of the Quran, he would never reprimand himself. But a, man, a blind man came to him. A blind man came to the Prophet. And he was seeking guidance. The Prophet was busy giving, invita he was uh, uh, inviting the, the senior among his tribe to Islam. The influential people, right? If you recruit them, they will bring their, the people that follow them. And the, ma the man was blind. So when he came, the Prophet only frowned. Frowned as in bad timing. Do you understand me, guys? Frowned as in bad timing. The man is blind. Does he see? So does it really bother him? No. That would be the most convenient thing to ever hide. The beginning of Surah Abasa says, Abasa wa tawalla. And ja'ahu al-a'ma. He frowned and turned away when the blind man came to him. Who in the world would reprimand himself in the book that he's trying to promote to you? Allah blamed him for having divorced someone. Uh, for, for in regards to, uh, what's her name? Radiallahu anha. Zainab bin Jahash. When he told Zayd, keep her with you. There were many verses in the Quran where the Prophet Muhammad was corrected by Allah himself. If he was the author of the Quran, I would remove those. If it was my book, wallah, I would remove them. You would remove them too. Why would he keep them? Because he was not speaking of his own desire. It was whatever God revealed to him. And can you imagine, sorry, the embarrassment maybe. When someone has to stand in front of the people and recite to them God's revelation about them. You know how difficult this would be for you. When you could easily hide it, right? He's the only one receiving revelation. It's not like they have another source where they're going to come say, We caught you. God revealed this verse to you, but you didn't tell us. They have no other source except him. Why would he ever tell them? Because he was the truthful one. He was sincere. And he did exactly what God told him. And that's exactly how Jesus described him. And in the Quran, and mentioned when Jesus, the son of Mary said, O children of Israel, indeed I am the messenger of Allah to you, confirming what came before me of the Torah. And bringing you tidings of a messenger to come after me whose name is Ahmed. And those who know Islam know that the Prophet has many names. Has many names. Among them is Ahmed and Muhammad, which are both derivatives of the word Hamd. Hamd means praise. The praised one. So even in the Quran, I'm running out of time. Yeah, I know, I know. So the, the, the Prophet Muhammad is mentioned, the, the Quran is confirming what the Bible had said about him. Then Allah says, This day I have perfected for you a religion and completed my favor upon you and has approved for you Islam as a religion. So Islam is the way of life that incorporates the belief in Jesus with the corrections that need to be made. And then at the end I say, The truth has come and falsehood has departed. Indeed is falsehood ever bound to depart. Subhanakallah bihamdik. Shadu Allah ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka atubu Thank you very much.